Good. Good to be here together this morning. We are on part six of this series that we've been on for the past number of weeks, The Gospel According to St. John. We're looking at this fourth book of the New Testament, which is really the story of Jesus from the perspective of the Apostle John. And it's a good place to start if you're unfamiliar with the Bible. It tells good stories of the life of Jesus and shares large portions of his teaching. And so we've been walking through that. And Right near the beginning, we talked about the purpose, John's purpose in writing his gospel, which John gives us at the end of the book. In John chapter 20, he tells us, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is why John is writing his gospel, so that we might believe that Jesus is the Messiah and then by believing we might have life in his name. We said right at the beginning that in John chapter 1, John starts his gospel by, by asking some of life's most fundamental questions and then holding up Jesus as the answer. And then in the past couple weeks, using John chapter 3 and chapter 4, we said that Jesus as the answer to life's most fundamental questions, Jesus as the solution to the human condition, to the eventuality of death, applies to perpetrator and victim alike. That the gospel, that salvation, that what Christ has done for us is for all of us, applies to all of us. Even to those that we might think would be out. Even to those that the disciples thought were surely out. A, a Samaritan woman with loose morals like we talked about last week. We said that the, the punishment for sin is not eternal damnation, but that... Uh, God is going to set things right and reconcile all of us to himself. This week, I wanna, we're going to look at this story that Linda just read for us from John chapter 5. But first, I want to just tie up a loose end, what I think is a loose end from, from last week. At the end of John chapter 5, verse 14 that Linda just read, it says this, Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, people look at that verse and will interpret it in different ways. And some people will say, hey, the eternal consequences of sin are worse than any physical ailment, right? Seeing in this verse eternal damnation. And even uh, the Bible that I have, the commentary that's associated with it, says exactly that. A, a commentary on the Scripture is just anybody that reads the Scripture and then writes down what they think about it is writing a commentary. And this Bible that I have is a study Bible, and so it, it contains the Scripture at the top and then a commentary at the bottom, what somebody thinks about what the Bible says. And the comment on this particular verse says exactly that. The eternal consequences of sin are more serious than any physical ailment. And one other kind of argument or thing that people will say related to eternal damnation, that the consequences of sin are eternal damnation, they will say, hey, God tells us that the wages of sin is death. The punishment for sin is eternal damnation, eternal separation from God. And even if it doesn't make sense to us, well, that's what God says. God's justice is perfect, is much higher than our justice. The Bible tells us that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so even though it doesn't make sense to us, well, this is what God says. The punishment for sin is eternal damnation. And to that, I always want to say, well, you know, when we say the words God is just or we say the words God is love, we mean something by that. Right. The, the phrase God is just carries meaning for us. If I asked any of you to de define what do we mean by God is just, we will all would de define that in the same way. We would say, well, it means that God is fair, that he does the right thing all the time, that he gives what is due. We, we have an understanding of God's justice. But, I mean, if God's justice is higher than ours, if his justice is so wholly unlike ours that it doesn't make sense to us, well, then all of a sudden, this phrase, God is just, doesn't mean anything. I mean, if we're saying we mean something by this phrase, God is just, but that meaning may or may not apply to God's justice. 
It, it might reflect what God means by God is just, or it might not. Well, then all of a sudden this phrase is meaningless. It, it, it means nothing. And it, to say it another way, if it doesn't make sense to us, well, then probably it doesn't make sense to God. Our, what we mean by this phrase, God is just, must at least approximate God's justice. And God's justice must at least come close to what we mean when we say God is just. Otherwise, it's meaningless. You know? And it's interesting to me that <clears throat> none of us would punish anybody for all eternity. None of us would torture somebody for all eternity. In fact, I think there's something in international law against the use of torture, right? This doesn't make sense to us. To say it another way, uh, Chandra and I went through a, a little incident in our life where uh, we had to vo vis visit with the police about something. And I was talking to this one police officer about a particular suspect and his alibi. And I said to the police officer, I mean, it just doesn't seem to make sense. And the police officer said, said to me, he's like, I've been doing this a long time. And usually, if it doesn't seem to make sense, it's because it doesn't make sense. You know? And I think if it doesn't make sense to us, probably it's because it doesn't make sense to God. You know? And so I think eternal damnation, it doesn't square with our idea of what is just. And so probably it doesn't square with God's idea of what is just either. Okay, loose end tied up from last week. Let's look at chapter 5. Now, before we jump into chapter 5, I've got to point out one little thing, all right? If you looked in the Bibles that are beneath your seat there, if you opened up to John chapter 5, oh, I missed this. I see, I wrote this down on my Bible here that I wasn't going to miss this. I don't want to miss this. Because if we say that uh, the Bible, or the, the consequence of sin is eternal damnation. Well, then all of a sudden, the gospel is not good news. The gospel is just the great warning, right? If you don't do it right, this is what's going to happen to you. The gospel is not the great warning. The gospel is good news, okay? Thank you, June. Back into John chapter 5. Here we go. So you'll notice, if you open your Bible that's beneath you, that there is no verse 4. It jumps right from verse 3 to verse 5, and all we have in there is 4 with a little footnote, okay? And the reason for that is the people that put together this version of the Bible that you, that's beneath your seats there thought that the earliest and most reliable manuscripts that we have of the Bible, the earliest and most reliable copies, do not contain verse 4. And so they thought, hey, we're going to leave it out. Even though some other manuscripts include it, they thought we're going to leave verse 4 out. But they couldn't just rearrange the verses because the King James ver Version and the New King James Version and other versions include verse 4. And we want the chapters and verses of the Bible to kind of line up across translations. Obviously, that's helpful. And so they just took verse 4 out. Uh, but verse 4 is helpful in understanding the story that Linda just read. She said all these people lie, uh, used to lie beside this pool, okay? And so uh, here's, here's verse 4. The paralyzed used to lie beside this pool, and they waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. All right, and then John goes on to talk about the invalid who'd been an invalid for 38 years. So this is why people were lying next to this pool. That the idea was, or the thought was, or the legend was, or whatever, that an angel would come and stir up the waters, and if you got in there first, you'd be cured, okay? Now, I think we want to ask the question, so why is John including this story in his gospel? What are we supposed to take from this story? What are we supposed to learn from this story? Again, all of us are looking at the Bible through a set of lenses. All of us are making interpretations or applications affected by our experiences, affected by our understanding. And, and we might read a particular passage one day and take something from it, and we might read the same passage the next day and take something else from it. And that's okay. Different people look at it differently. And 
But I think we want to ask that question. Why is he including this story? What should we learn from it? Of course, anytime I preach on a passage, then I will look up what other people say about it. I'll read commentaries on the particular passage. I'll look up other sermons or watch other people and see what they say about this particular passage. And this week I watched a sermon by a pastor in Texas <clears throat> uh, talking about this same passage that we just read. And he preached a three-point sermon on this passage. And this is what he said. He said, Jesus came to the man and said, do you want to be made well? And the man did not say yes. He, in fact, he just made some sort of excuse. And so the pastor said to the congregation, hey, whatever's going on in your life, whatever needs to change in your life, you need to quit making excuses. And then he said, the man really wasn't putting in any effort. I mean, he was just casting the blame on other people. Nobody puts me in the water. And so the pastor said to the congregation, hey, whatever is going on in your life, whatever needs to change in your life, you need to quit making excuses and you need to put in a little effort. And then he said, uh, and the man was expecting an angel to stir up the water, right? He wasn't expecting that Jesus was going to come along or whatever. And so the pastor said to the congregation, whatever is going on in your life, whatever needs to change in your life, you need to quit making excuses. You need to put in a little effort and you need to open yourself up to the possibility that your experience may not be what you expect or may be different from last time. This was his take on that passage. And I think that's good. I mean, I think there's a good, there's time for that. In fact, here's the ending, the very ending of his sermon, okay? So I'm asking you, do you want to be made well? What's the area of your life you need to be made well? Okay, stop making excuses. Put some effort in it. And humble yourself that your experience might not be the way it has been in the past. There's his, his take on John chapter 5. And I mean, I think that's good. That's good advice. I mean, we, we all need to hear that from time to time in our life about the things that need to change. Quit making excuses. Put in a little effort. Maybe expect the unexpected in, in your life. I think that's, you can draw that from, from this passage. And I mean, I'm not trying to throw him under the bus. I think this is... Uh, uh, you, you can read it that way, and certainly he does. This is Robert Morris from Gateway Church in the Dallas area. I'm not, I've never heard him personally, but uh, the things I've heard about him and the people that I know who know him, he's just a really, really good guy and really, really supportive of the other pastors in the community and all of this. So that's uh, you know, his take on that. And again, good advice, helpful for, for us uh, at times. I said something similar this week. Uh, Anders is playing baseball, and uh, we were pitching in the backyard this week, and so I was serving as the catcher, and he was uh, pitching and doing well, and then Adeline came along, well, she wanted to be the catcher for a little bit, and so I gave her the glove, and she, she uh, got down there, and the first few pitches that Anders threw to Adeline were fairly erratic, and, uh, and then, Adeline, or then Anders was like, she's not holding the glove right and giving me a good target kind of thing. And I said, Anders, quit blaming it on your sister and throw the ball over the plate, right? Quit making excuses. Put in a little effort, right? Don't blame it on your sister. Uh, we use this. Now, not to, you know, just use Anders as the example. I, uh, about a month and a half ago, I tweaked my back playing hockey. And in the aftermath, I thought to myself, ah, probably something that would help my back. I, uh, I bet you there's 15 pounds there that my back probably doesn't need to carry, you know? So I've been working on that over the past month and a half. And my, my routine is I weigh myself every morning. The same time, same routine. And if uh, you know, I'm a little heavier than the day before, well, then I aggressively reduce my eating. And if I'm less, well, then I give myself a little more latitude. This morning wasn't terribly good, unfortunately. Uh, but I got to quit making excuses. I got to put in a little effort. I got to do these things. It's good advice. It's good advice. But as I reflect on John chapter 5, through the lens, I think to myself, I don't think the Apostle John is writing to give us good advice. 
I don't think the gospel is good advice. Good advice is helpful. We need it at times. But this is not why John is writing. He's not writing to help us better ourselves. John is writing to give us good news. To tell us that the fundamental questions of life have been answered in the person of Jesus. Because here's the thing about good advice. Good advice is helpful for me. Help me better myself, the things that I need to do, and we need to hear that sometimes, and there's a, there's a time for that. But good advice does nothing to solve the great problems of humanity. It does nothing for people who have been the victims of just incredible tragedy in the world. It does nothing to offer hope and redemption in the face of the difficulties of life, in the face of the eventuality of uh, life's mortality. And I think what, jo what John wants to give us is not good advice, but good news. I said I wasn't going to throw Robert Morris under the bus, but I just got one other little clip, and he's kind of being facetious himself, okay? So uh, here's one little deal. So God, in the body of a human, walks up to this guy and says, Again, it isn't it a, it's just a simple question. You just you think the guy would say yes, but say yes, and he gives this excuse. You know, I've never been in all the time. Nobody put me in the water. And you know what? I don't even believe the excuse. I mean, I think if you really want, if the guy really wanted to be really well, it would seem like he could have just laid on the edge of the pool, and when the angel came down, he could have just you know. You know <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> Again, I mean, he's being a little facetious. He's just, you know, that's, that's okay. And again, don't make excuses. Put in a little effort. There's a time for that. There's a time for that. But as I think about John chapter 5, as I think about the gospel of John, I think to myself, he is holding up Jesus as the answer to life's fundamental questions as hope and redemption in the face of life's great tragedies. I, I, I think to myself, I have nothing to say to a person who's been an invalid for 38 years. I have no business saying anything, giving any advice to a person who's experienced. Don't make excuses and put in a little effort and you're not thinking about it right. What he needs is not good advice. He needs good news. And Jesus doesn't give him good advice. In fact, it's interesting. I mean, the guy didn't even know who Jesus was. Right? The passage tells us, tells us that Jesus walks up to him and says, do you want to be made well? And he says, sir, there's nobody to put me in the pool. Right? I mean, Jesus had done a couple miracles up to this point. He was gaining a reputation. And if the guy had recognized him, he'd be like, Jesus, make me well, right? He didn't even know who Jesus was. He expressed no faith in the person of Jesus. And Jesus comes up to him and says, hey, you who've been an invalid for 38 years, you who maybe you're just making excuses and maybe you're not putting in any effort and you've, you're expressing no faith what the gospel is for you to stand up and walk I think this is John is writing to give us the good news of the gospel the gospel is not the great warning it is not good advice it is good news for all of us the great warning will just leave you living in fear good advice while helpful for us at times, is not going to solve the world's problems. It's just going to put it on you. It's just going to put it on us. We've got to do it. But good news whew, results in relief, in joy, in gratitude. And I think that will have the added benefit of changing our life. The gospel it's not the great warning. It's not good advice. It's good news for you, for me, for the Samaritan woman with loose morals, for the invalid of 38 years, for those who have experienced life's great tragedies for all of us. 
he's writing so that we might know that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing we might find life in his name, the answer to life's great questions. The gospel is good news. And I think John gives it to us again in chapter 5. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for your word to us. It's a reminder of your presence with us, the hope that is ours in you because of Christ. Lord, thank you for uh, giving us hope in life and hope for the life to come. I pray that as we come together every Sunday, that it would be for us a reminder of your love for us, of the good news of the gospel that would produce in us gratitude and that we'd live aware of and grateful for your love for us. And so uh, we're thankful for that this time together this morning for each person here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.